Yeah? Uh, so the testimonies are not necessarily what we would call ego texts. The survivor is not necessarily the author of the text. Uh, therefore, you have polyphony going on, which I find particularly uh, interesting. And of course, if you have um, a text based on an interview, you, uh, but if that is a narrative coherent text, the questions asked are no longer directly accessible. We don't exactly know what have these people been asked. So what I want to emphasize is the importance of context for an analysis. Um, so, for instance, to, to, to illustrate uh, uh, this, we've got here um, a, uh, a young um, a boy who tells us, before the war, I lived in Kosovo. Now, um, you could be almost forgiven for thinking this is a German text, because Vater Mulchome habe ich gewohnt in Kosovo. Those of us who know German will be able to understand all of these words, except, of course, for this one here, this chappie is the alien of the lot and gives the game away um, because Mulchoma comes from Milchama, which is Hebrew for war, which identifies the language as Yiddish. Yiddish uses a lot of Hebrew words. But uh, you might ask, well, hang on a minute, um, Yiddish uses the Hebrew script. Why is a boy who's a Yiddish speaker using the Latin alphabet? Uh, and you see how bore she is at doing this. If you look at his actual testimony, you see immediately that he is far more comfortable in this uh, 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 script. Yeah? So my uh, reading of this is uh, that um, he tried to be or had to be user-friendly because where was he? He was in a DP camp uh, run by, uh, by UNRWA in Asher, by Kribo, uh, in Kibbutz Atid. Uh, so, so he gives us all this uh, here in the Latin alphabet. Um, because the aid workers would not necessarily have been able to read and understand uh, Yiddish, but then he uh, starts with Meine Eltern holding the high so the name of his parents, etc. And all the holdings in, in uh, all the testimonies in this holding, these holdings start with the same kind of structure, which indicates also that the children were given guidelines on how to um, uh, write. Now, the focus of my talk today is going to be on interviews and interview-based testimonies of young uh, survivors. And I'm going to uh, compare two holdings, namely Boda's interviews and the CJHC testimonies, which were based on interviews but had lo have lost that quality in terms of its genre. I want to know what questions were asked of children and in how far the context and the ways in which information was uh, gathered also shaped that information. And so we were looking at the impact of um, all this um, on the transmission and on what was transmitted. And I'm also going to argue that uh, you can uh, sometimes feel a conflict underlying the motivation of the interlocutors, namely a conflict between, on the one hand, trying to um, yeah, work historiographically, get facts, get figures, get, get detail, get, get, get um, um, order, get the basics right. And on the other hand, an engagement with the psyche and the, and the problems and the emotional side of the um, uh, uh, interview ease. I'm going to show you that. Uh, when you actually read those um, child testimonies, uh, you are struck um, by um, at least two things. Firstly, uh, the information is always arranged strictly in chronological order. And everything comes across as very orderly. And secondly, the, the tone is very sober, very matter of fact. There's barely an adjective in sight. And you think, uh, that doesn't, doesn't feel right. Yeah? So, of course, the children came from different backgrounds, from different locations, etc. So it's difficult to compare them. But what they, of course... Um, uh, Ha often had in common is the fact that they lost close relatives. So I've screened the testimonies for how this particular aspect is represented. And I'll give you an example. Um, Rachela here tells us, two of my sisters went to another farmer because we couldn't be together. There, two Germans found them and shot them. For a few weeks, we were in an attic with mum. Mum went to search for another hiding place and fell into the hands of the Ukrainian police who recognized her and killed her on the spot. Then we had to leave our host. This is bizarre. Yeah? None of us would relate the, the death of, of siblings or a parent uh, like, like that. Or here, Severin says, the following morning, mum and I went to the post office to call dad and the aunt, but we learned that they were already dead. After a few days, we drove to Legionovo. 
Now, this te testimony is particularly interesting because at the end of it, you get a section that you often don't get, and it is here entitled Answers to, to the Questions, and here he says the most intense experience that I had was when I lost um, all, um, when I lost everybody, when I lost my uh, uh, family. So this is kind of, kind of strange. We got the previous uh, a, a slide, which is kind of devoid of emotion, and then uh, you get the, the postscriptum, so to speak, uh, uh, testifying to the fact that this had been the most horrible, the most deep uh, ex experience. And of course, before mentioning questions, we, we, we are alerted to the fact, yes, this is, was an interview situation, I was asked, this boy, boy was asked questions. What kind of questions? Well, the CJHC worked with a questionnaire um, and um, they, um, uh, this questionnaire featured a methodological part um, written by Noel Grus, one of the founding members of uh, the CJHC, and then there is a questionnaire. I'll briefly take you uh, through that. Um, Grus um, uh, addresses um, the goal of, the, um, uh, of, of testimonies uh, the method to be um, employed by the interlocutors, the technique, and then also what uh, interlocutors had to do after the um, uh, um, uh, interview. Grus says the goal of the investigation is to collect material for the charges against German fascism and to convince the world that all seeds of fascism must be ruthlessly destroyed once and for all. So here, the collection of historical evidence um, uh, of judicial evidence even seems to be um, uh, the prime mover. However, um, he then uh, uh, also says that we're interested in vivid narration, in narrative temperament, and also in the observation of reactions to remember experiences. So this is a far more psychological uh, interest working um, uh, here. Um, and he even goes so far as to say that even if the children um, I I exaggerate something or embellish something, that's not really the point because we don't really want to look for historical evidence uh, here, but we are exploring the psyche of a child. So you see here the conflict between historiography and um, uh, psychology. After the interview, the interviewers were supposed to order their note rec notes, reconstruct the interview, order everything thematically, um, keep quotations but work them in uh, right in the first person, type the statement up and send it in to headquarters, and the original interview notes were then destroyed. So what we have um, in Warsaw today where this um, uh, set of testimonies um, is housed is just the narrative final um, product. Uh, Silk's questionnaire is a massive one, has more than 120 questions, but uh, uh, basically orders into these chapters. But of course, the, not, uh, the children weren't asked these questions one by one. It doesn't make sense uh, to ask a child um, uh, who had uh, survived um, uh, in a, uh, a camp about life in the forest, right? Because that child wasn't living in the forest. Uh, so you get um, here. Um, a lot of um, historical questions or factual questions like where were you, when, etc., what happened, but you also get psychological questions like what were you feeling, um, uh, were you alone or with your, with your parents, etc., etc. In the general section here, you get questions about a material legacy, Did, have you got any letters, poems, songs that were written, um, and also the, the questionnaire um, asks repeatedly about how the child was feeling. So here there is an, a, a willingness to engage with feelings. Then the question, if that is the case, the question then is why do the actual narrative texts marginalize um, emotion? And I would say um, there are several um, uh, issues here that might have played a, a role. Firstly, other evidential genres such as affidavits or police reports, which are far more established, um, would have um, played into it because, after all, testimonies were also used for uh, post-war Nazi um, uh, uh, trials. Um, so a, a, a willingness to inscribe texts into those genres um, uh, was probably there. However, in Poland there was also a vibrant tradition of life history writing, um, even before the war, um, magazines um, uh, quite often did competitions and people, especially peasants and working class uh, people, wrote uh, their life stories and quite often apparently in a rather stoic uh, fashion, so that might have had an impact um, as well. Um, of course, uh, interlocutors might have also thought, well, in historiography, 
emotion doesn't really have that much of a place and it's obvious anyway. Um, or, of course, you could read it more psychologically and say, well, maybe um, the interlocutors um, and the interviewees shied away from emotion because the interlocutors would have been survivors as well. It would have been painful for all concerned. So, for instance, Philip Friedman um, uh, said um, that the researcher's attitude should not be sentimental or emotional since the only right approach is insightful and sharp analysis, the strong focus on the rational uh, here. Uh, so, uh, Laura Jokush has read um, uh, the, uh, this particular um, emphasis on historiography and rationalization as an attempt to, uh, at rationalizing what happened at working through the experience, trauma and um, uh, loss. Um, children, of course, could themselves have been repressing their, feel their feelings, and there has been a lot of work, of course, done on the impact of traumatic memory um, and traumatic repression, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but if you look at testimonies, th there's a minority of testimonies in that collection that was actually um, uh, sent in to CJHC rather than generated uh, with the help of the staff employed. And here you find texts tend to be much more emotional, much less well ordered, um, and this difference illustrates the impact of adult interviewers on child testimonies. I'll give you an example. Anna Schuldiner had been hiding during an action under a pile of brushes in a factory, and she says she describes the moment of, of, of discovery where a afterwards. Suddenly I hear somebody calling for me, but I was so scared and startled that I didn't respond. My mum thought I'd been killed and started crying. When I heard mum's voice, I called out, etc., etc., threw myself into my mum's arms, shaking all over. I'd seen that dad and three aunts were missing. I started howling. Mum cried with me. Much more emotional uh, 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 text here. Um, now, how does that uh, compare then with... Um, uh, texts uh, with, with um, um, testimonial uh, holdings where we actually have um, the actual interview. Um, the uh, Boda, um, Boda's project is, uh, is highly unusual because he went to DP camps in 1946 in various European country, countries and wiretaped the, the, the conversations he had. So here you have question, answer, question, answer, and you can compare uh, that to the other um, texts uh, in that um, uh, regard. Several of his interviewees were under um, age. And you can see here, uh, if you're looking at his uh, interviews, how strong an impact and how strong a role the um, interviewer actually had on the, on the kind of generation that was generated. He interviews here Kalman Eisenberg, um, who, who says, I had a mother 40 years old and two older brothers, one of whom perished with a tragic death in my arms inflicted by the Germans. Uh, Boda eggs him on, no end, and the rest, one sister and the other brother, were taken to Dr. Treblinka, about whom to this day there is not word. Um, uh, you, you, he, Eisenberg is, is asked um, about the, the loss of uh, uh, family members, and he addresses the loss of different family members that happened in different contexts, um, all at once. How does Boda uh, respond? Wait, I want that in order so you were at home who, who was supporting the family. This is kind of a strange response, isn't it? With somebody going back to economy, to, to location, when somebody else has just told them about their, their big losses um, uh, uh, suffered. You might think, well, you know, this is almost dysfunctional. Why harp on about that? Why not stay with this topic um, uh, uh, here? Um, and uh, so, so Boda's uh, um, role as an interviewer is quite a strong one. He often interrupts his, his, um, uh, his uh, partners. He often steers them in a particular direction. He re in, uh, repeats things. He asks questions. There's quite a strong impact on the information uh, uh, gathered. The question also is, that did he himself sometimes shy away from traumatic uh, narratives? And um, I want to demonstrate uh, to you the importance of the tapes, because with a written text, we lose so much of the actual conversation. And Boda's uh, testi testimony, his project is such a um, godsend, because here we have the voices, we, we, and we get a, diff a separate layer of information. Um, when he interviews Edith Sierra and asks her about 
the hardest moment in her life. The girl uh, says, well, when they took away the mama, I remained alone with the sister. By the way, the interview is in German, and Boda translated uh, these texts into English, so it is Boda's translation, not mine. Yeah? Without a penny, we had no money, no, we didn't know where the father was, etc., etc. And then when I left all alone, so she, she summarizes all these horrible um, uh, moments for her. What does Boda um, respond to? Now, when you worked in the munitions factory, where did you sleep? If you just read this, you think this guy is dysfunctional. What, 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 what is this? But he's not dysfunctional. If you actually listen to the audio file, you get a very, very different um, uh, impression. And I'm going to try to play this to you. You're going to hear this uh, in, in um, a German, um, but it's not difficult to understand. It's very quick as well now. How, how do you work? Let's see. That was it. You, you, you hear how this bright, cheerful voice of this girl falters and how, how she becomes quiet when she was talking about this. You hear the long pause. He is basically trying to get onto safer territory because she's probably losing her, 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 her comportment um, and he's desperately trying to think, well, what can I, can I ask her now? But this is an in a level of interpretation that is not necessarily open to you when you just read the text. So it makes you uh, uh, realize that um, the com complex motivation um, and um, uh, the, the uh, interviews um, uh, that Boda has are quite uh, special because they give you this oral uh, information that we don't have um, otherwise. Um, Boda himself also, like um, the CJHC staff, were interested in what the individual had to say in their story, but also uh, in, in piecing together a representative picture um, but then also then uh, says, well, it wasn't actually for historiography, but, but material for future uh, research. Again, here we've got a mixed uh, set of motivations. And Boda's project is uh, so interesting because we've got direct access to these survivors' voices. The stories are yet unrefined. And the medium also um, it ha it keeps the interviewer's voice in the foreground, not only that of the survivor. And this is really quite a, a, a very rare occurrence to have recorded dialogue in early testimonies. But it also affects, uh, illustrates how media uh, themselves affect transmission and um, reception. And Boda here displays a similar conflict between historiography and psychology-oriented approach to, his, um, um, to the people he talks to um, as the CJHC staff in their testimonies. Did. So I wanted to show you the importance of testimonial <coughs> context for, trans for the transmission process and the trans uh, transmitted. And you'll see how often there are things that are actually obviously missing and things that cannot easily be explained, things that have been lost probably forever. Um, but in my view, that does not invalidate these testimonies um, at all. It makes them more complex, more interesting, because I think that the silences, the omissions are often um, as important as what is actually there, you know, in the foreground. That's what that was me done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beata, for a really interesting paper. We'll ask Beata questions at the end after after um, all three papers. Um, without further ado, I'll introduce Francis Jones.
uh, Jones, who is going to talk to us today about um, poetry translation. Francis um, researches in the area of poetry translation, but is also a translator of poetry, um, particularly from Bosnian and Serbian. And this, this paper is um, focusing just on poetry from Serbia. Right. Thanks. Um, how do I? Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll do it. Let me do. You start. <coughs> Thanks for me, too, Beata, for a very moving paper and uh, fascinating, too. Um, I think a link with mine, perhaps, is both people going through um, traumatic events, perhaps not so much as yours, but also the idea of multiple multiple voicing, polyphony, how we think we, we read one voice and in actual fact there are more people involved in it. Um, actually, do you want to stand in front? Or, or um, am I, am I yeah, uh, you need uh, to be reasonably close to the micros as to be captured from the All right. Okay, I'll, I'll stand here. Then. Um, I'm looking here, though, at translation. Um, the different ways in which translation transmits ideological viewpoints and transmits them outside a single language's boundaries. And so by transmitting them outside those languages boundary, that language's boundaries, it can actually gather international support for these positions. I'll be making special reference to communities in conflict in the ex-Yugoslav region with a particular focus on the wars of the 1990s, but there'll be implications for other settings too. I'm, I'm trying to say something general about translation and ideology. Why poetry? Um, I'll give you an example poem there. Two reasons why they might be useful. Um, Firstly, poetry in itself is a highly valued cultural product. So here you see um, a translation from probably early this century, 1920 I think, of uh, an event uh, in medieval Serbian history, the Battle of Kosovo in 1389, these are, this is an extract from a bardic epic collected in the 19th century telling of the la this last battle and positioning it as the medieval Serbian Christian kingdom standing in for the whole of Christendom fighting the Ottoman Turkish invaders and going down fighting. So translating that could be transmitting an ideological content there but Translating a highly valued cultural product like poetry also transmits the message that um, our culture has value. So promoting Serbian culture, so which in the 1990s and 2000s to, to a certain extent was ostracised, being ostracised because of the events in the, the Balkan Wars. Um, just better take pause and give a definition of ideology. My definition is completely value neutral. Um, a set of ideas that basically a community takes for granted. And uh, these, these might be positive, might be negative, seen from outside. So, for example, a positive ideology might be that it's good to die for what you believe in, for example. I'm referring to former Yugoslavia. I, I'll try and keep the historical background to the minimum, but just to, to fill you in, and apologies if some of you know this. Um, the main the yeah, theme in, I'm looking at is what 1990s, 2000s Yugoslavia, communities in conflict and post-conflict or reconciliation. But I'm focusing just for simplicity's sake, on one component state, Republika 
the Republika of the Yugoslav Federation, Serbia. Um, during the, this period um, in cultural and intellectual life, there were two types of opposing ideologies or narratives going on, narratives being a story that makes sense with an ideological underpinning. One of them is a, a very strong narrative of ethno-nationalism. Ethno-nationalism. Nationalism on an ethnic base. Drawing the definition of what to be Serbian is to be not Muslim, is to be not Albanian, is to be not Croatian. Um, Unfortunately, in Croatia and Bosnia, for the Bosnian Muslims, they speak exactly the same language, uh, perfectly mutually comprehensible. So, therefore, in order to define your nation narrowly, you've got to draw on symbols of cultural identity. So, Christianity, oh no, the Croats are also Christian. Okay, Eastern Christianity, um, for example, the... The, the medieval heritage, the bardic epic, uh, and so on. During the 1980s, Serbian ethno-nationalism was the first of the ethno-nationalisms in former Yugoslavia to rise up as a profound and, you know, I must say, fairly noxious political force. I must add, by the way, that as a researcher and a tra as a translator from the region, I try to be neutral, but obviously being involved, as Kate Adie was saying last night, it's, uh, it's impossible. So, Serbian ethno-nationalism grew up basically in response to a sense that outside Serbia proper, Serbs were living all over Yugoslavia. If it looked like different parts of the country were going independent, they'd become a minority and a persecuted minority. So ethno-nationalism rose as a political force. Um, of course, the nearer it, as communism broke down, other countries started getting their own ethno-nationalisms based on difference with Serbia, and the whole thing escalated until by 1992 we had an ethno-nationalist regime in Serbia which had inherited the Yugoslav People's Army I think the seventh most seventh most powerful army in Europe or the third, Maybe the third. I, I can't remember so basically sponsoring a series of wars to ostensibly protect the Serbian minority in different places um, nobody's hands were clean here so I'm very much simplifying things um, against this there was a small what you could call cosmopolitanist opposition so here are some pictures of the, of the wars basically lasting from 92 till 99 but against this even during the ethno-nationalist domination of the early 90s, there was what you could call a cosmopolitanist um, opposition, resistance. Basically saying, we are a decent nation. Cosmopolitanist ideology is one that political organisation shouldn't be dependent on a person's identity. The state has the responsibility to all. Nowadays in Serbia, there's about a 50-50 political split. The cosmopolitanists, the democrati, are now in government with something like 55% um, of the popular vote and are looking towards EU membership, basically being treated as a rough and ready but decent working minority. The radicali the ethno-nationalists are about 45%, so they're in opposition at the moment. It doesn't seem to matter that uh, at least their main leader is on trial for war crimes. And so, that was a quick run through the history. My database, 
for looking at ideology in translation in this very ideologically charged field basically I tried to find all the translations of works by Serbian poets I could over this significant period I think about half of them were on the web about half of them were in print um, what I'll be using it in this talk is to say how do how does poetry translation mediate this ideological conflict um, four different ways firstly selection which poems get translated and which don't which get published in translation and which <coughs> don't presentation what about introductions where are these published where are they posted comments so paratexts is another, another term thirdly more subtle team identity what is the ethno-national identity of the players just from Serbia or from other parts of former Yugoslavia or internationally and fourthly and this is perhaps where translation studies is focused on most once there's a, actually a poem has been selected does the translator manipulate it ideologically in any way does that betray any sort of intervention and I'll look at these four in order firstly selection dagger a poem called dagger Bordeaux I don't know if you can read that the wolf is the totem the pre-Christian totem of the Serb people um, it's figured as that in, uh, in some modern poetry so a Serbian reader would immediately pick up on wolf isn't a random animal to my mind this is a poem very much against ethno-nationalist war against the warmongering um, the Serb nation is killing itself because of its bloodlust it's ending up trying to drink its own blood and it's ending up dying so leaving a wasteland behind in the sample of 70 poems there was a minority I think about 15 so 70 publications a minority I can't quite recall about 10 or 15 which were cosmopolitanist anti-ethno-nationalist no poem content had ethno-nationalist content at least not unequivocally the vast majority though were just treating normal poetic subjects love, life memory things like that just just like poets do second aspect is presentation mm -hmm. here I've chosen one which actually surprisingly occurred in the Serbian sample the wife of Hassan Aga Hassan Aga is the general or warlord Hassan it's a tale of Bosnian Muslim life the Hassan Aga's wife because she doesn't he's been wounded in a border war fighting the Christians on the border with Croatia so a long way from Serbia yeah for some reason for shame she doesn't go and visit him a messy divorce results the husband gets custody of the children and it's utterly tragic so probably written written down and worked up by a woman poet sometime in the mid to late 18th century collected in Croatia how come it's featuring in the sample well presentation the poem was initially published in Italian parallel Italian and South Slav version Goethe picked up on this translated it on into German as far as I know he didn't speak South Slav. So here we've got the web poster, it's, it's on a web forum, positioning it as Serb patriotism. So 
well, you could say a sort of mild ethno-nationalist. Here there's a bit from the original introduction to the translation back in 1913. The only bit of the introduction that's been posted, I'll keep this down there, based on the life of the Mohammedan Serbs. So these people are being positioned as Serbs. Um, yeah, I think most Bosnian Muslims wouldn't agree with that. But anyway, so <coughs> we're already seeing a positioning, but now if I can show you the website that's being put on. Stormfront, oh crikey. Yeah. Stormfront or stormfront.org in gothic letters. White pride worldwide. So this is actually being produced on a, an extreme right um, European uh, nationalist forum of um, some of the some of the other threads in it are fairly blood curdling you know, how to design pipe bombs and things like that. So this. Bosnian Muslim poem is actually being positioned in, in the service of extreme Serbian ethno-nationalism and saying we are like other extreme European nationalisms. So by the presentation alone. In my sample I found a minority presentations were ethno-nationalist, a minority of presentations were anti-ethno-nationalist, cosmopolitanist, <coughs> So, feminist poetry, for example, identifying ethno-nationalism with patriarchal systems and things like that. The majority were perhaps don't mention the war. This is Serbian poetry. Serbia is a normal poetic country. Well, I'll gloss over that. Third thing, team identity. How does this show ideology? Published in the States. US editor. So it's immediately transnational. And in fact, no ethno-nationalist translations were had players, editors, publishers, translators who weren't Serbian. This you can see is again it's showing it's a cosmopolitanist enterprise. Croatia, Serbia and Slovenia, the three key South Slav Republike, all compiled by the same person, Alex Demeliak, not a Serb, but from Slovenia. And in his introduction, he writes that he chose Serbian poets who were resisting the dominant ethno-nationalist narrative. So here we're seeing that team makeup can reflect ideology. So three aspects. Let's look now at the fourth. Translator intervention. This has had most attention in translation studies. In fact, ideology and translation is a fairly thriving branch of translation studies but by far the vast majority of the work has looked at how the translator manipulates the text how the translator changes the text and adds or changes the ideology might be inadvertently might much more rarely deliberately so let's see how far this applies to our study here's Dagger there's the source text. The tick means it's translated straight. It's more or less literal. So there's no visible translator intervention, really, until we get down here. Yeah, Yejichinu. Ina is a sort of augmentative, like um, orne in Italian, which says it's a big, it's a sort of big tongue. 
So, you know, this, it's been sort of intensified or specified to not big, but meaty. Um. And here, Sladnog Sechiva from the cold blade has become, the, the translator's added, from the hard cold blade. So, yeah, a slight bit of explicitation, intensifying the story slightly. Now, I hesitate to say that this is ideological intervention. It might be making an ideological tale more vivid, but might that not just be the translator's tendency to communicate well, to make things vivid? There's no... The evidence is too little there. One of the features, though, is that of this database is most of the poetry is modern, which means that it's in free verse. Free verse is fairly easy to translate literally. So let's take a look at a, of some of the older verse in fixed rhythm. If you've got fixed rhyme or rhythm, that's much more difficult to translate literally. So you'd expect more changes. Then perhaps those changes might have ideological effect. So, let's go back to the wife of Pasanaga. What's going on? Yeah, there are more changes. Goria Zelenoi. Goria can mean forest or mountain. And Zelenoi is green. Yeah, so that's been sort of compacted to wood. So, you can see it's maybe taking a choice that's there in the text. Milk, the swans have become... They aren't swans either, has become, they aren't milk white swans. Aga Hassan, Aga Hassan Aga, it was written down by an Italian, um, has become Hassan Aga, so it's deleted one of the Agas. Pushing it a bit to say that that is sort of deleting the Bosnian Muslim. Yeah, very shame. To my mind, as somebody who's also translated the Hassan Aginitsa, you have to do stuff to make it fit the rhythm, but the translator seems to be doing fairly standard. You try not to, you try to keep within the existing images. So again, I can't see any evidence of ideology, or at least if there is. Here it's intensifying a, a Muslim story, which isn't intensifying a sort of Serbian nationalist or sort of Serbian patriotic text in the introduction that this translator gave. So, to sum up, how does the translator translate ideological positions? Selection is really quite important. This was on uh, a web forum. By the way, one thing I didn't mention is that about half the translations were translated by Serbian native speakers. So, this I think is a translation by the poster herself. So yeah, selection there is important, an anti-war poem there. Presentation is even more important. So, this is being presented forums of pravda.ru so a pan-slavic discussion forum a Serbian culture forum Serbian lyric forum here's our great well-loved poet Desanka Maksimovic um, so yeah just being presented as poetry less important but supportive is team identity here, here's the poster, and here's the um, somebody who replies. If you're familiar with sir, with iconography from the say, from the 1990s, they're both well, they're, they're pretty ethno national, pretty Serbian nationalist, shall we say? Otajbina in Gothic Cyrillic letters. Otajbina, fatherland. And Yelena has got the Serbian flag in her eye. So it may be important. 
I'm not saying what it means. That's but translator intervention in the text, well, not so important. Translator is thrown in padding, but again, I can't see it as incredibly important. So yeah, that's my position. Is that seems to be how positions are transmitted. Thanks, for another fascinating um, circumstances. Um, we're going to move on now to Sarah Levy's paper. Um, her title has changed slightly from what you've got on your program. It's now called Transmitting the Atmosphere, Rehabilitating the French Screenwriter. And this is part of a research, a collaborative research project that Sarah's engaged with, um, with a colleague at Manchester Metropolitan University. And the paper's to do with this time from it, transmission between, from word to screen, um, looking at screenwriters and how, how, it, how the screenwriter is transmitted to screen. Thanks, Teresa. Um, my paper is a, a bit of an interloper in this panel where we've had two absolutely fascinating uh, discussions of, of really very, very interesting, very serious topics. I'm going to talk about something that is um, uh, really quite different uh, and relating to, uh, also draws on questions to do with historiography but in, in a completely different context. I suppose one point of commonality that, that if one really wanted to stretch a point might be to do with um, how one gets from how we get to the end text the final text in this case the film through all the various versions and, and writings of, of the screen uh, the script the screenplay what the interventions of the screenwriters might be and uh, I'm not going to answer that question <laughs> today because I don't know the answer yet I'm at the beginning of this research project, so what I want to do is outline that. Um, so apologies uh, for the change of title and also the new abstract, which I hope you've uh, seen. It's been circulated on a handout. Right. Um, as uh, Teresa said, thank you. Uh, thank you. That this is a, a part. Of, so this is outlining really a, a, a larger project. Um, which I'm working on with colleague Isabel van der Sheldon, who's based at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, and um, in th the concept of transmissions is really doubly useful for, for my paper. Um, firstly, um, really I suppose in, in the sense that Kate Adie was talking, to, uh, talking about yesterday, transmissions as, as a way of, you know, in, in relation to the mass media, as a way of how, when films are screened, how they put across meaning to audiences. So, uh, uh, you know, and, and what, how we get the, the language that is then put into the mouths of the actors who then perform that language as a way of communicating and transmitting meaning. Um, the second uh, uh, co uh, way in which uh, this concept is useful is in relation to the historiography of, of French cinema. Um, in my, my argument, my central argument here is that there has been a blockage in transmission uh, in relation to the history of the screenwriter. This is not an area that is well known, uh, even though these figures are extremely important in the history of French cinema. And so this is something that we want to look into. Why did this happen? Uh, you know, they, uh, why have these figures really been... Uh, do, do they remain below the surface when there are important studies looking at I mean, directors as auteurs uh, you know, it's about 90% of what the work that gets done uh, on French cinema but also producers, set designers costume designers so where are the screenwriters well I blame the new wave <laughs> um, the, the new wave really sounded, uh, the, certainly in critical terms, the death knell for the screenwriter. Um, and if we, or at least it tried to, uh, it certainly didn't manage to get rid of screenwriters. Uh, that would be uh, that's a, a, a gross exaggeration. 
Um, a, a good example uh, text, perhaps, to, to, to look at uh, in order to, to look a, li a little bit more deeply into why this is the case is uh, uh, François Truffaut's 1954 uh, text, a very is kind of now notorious in, in, in um, many uh, ways, uh, entitled Une certaine tendance du cinéma français, uh, a certain tendency of French cinema, um, in which uh, really Truffaut is, is it, it's his battle cry. He's setting out his critical position uh, against what he sees as the stagnating uh, cinema of the tradition of quality that dominates in the 1950s and which he sees as being you know, the, the, a kind of cinema which prevents um, the accession of new filmmakers and in particular himself and his pals uh, to, to, to make films. Um, but he bla it's very interesting the terms in which he, he makes this argument. So first of all he picks up on uh, what he terms the réalisme psychologique of the tradition of quality uh, and he says, he argues that this is the result of the work of the scénaristes, the screenwriters and in particular he singles out a, a very important pair of writers uh, who worked in partnership Jean Orange and Pierre Bost who were responsible for uh, really some of the most successful films of, of the, the early uh, and, and mid-1950s, but you can see his list here. And I'll talk more about uh, Henri Janson uh, later on. <coughs> when we look a bit deeper into what he means by this réalisme psychologique, in fact what he seems to be complaining about and he, what he really picks up on is the use of what he terms blasphemous language and anti-clerical sentiment and there's a, really an extraordinary kind of um, conservative aspect here really almost prudish in his reaction to the language and the stories that are being told in the tradition of quality um, and, <coughs> and, and so, so that's, that's one sort of key point the second perhaps point he makes is how this is really a cabal a monopoly uh, there are only a few writers and they all have their own story and they tell it over and over again. Um, now, any, even the most cursory research shows that there are sort of between 30 and 40, depending on how we uh, interpret the term regularly working, uh, writers uh, who are working uh, uh, you know, in, in French cinema at this time. And by this I'm talking about professional writers. I don't mean uh, non-professionals and I, I, I haven't included um, either uh, directors who co-write their films um, uh, because this is, uh, Truffaut would have excluded them uh, from his uh <coughs> analysis here. So it, that, that seems to be, uh, again, uh, something of an exaggeration. Um, his third point... Uh, and again, you can see here he's picking up on Laurent Chambos, it, is that these are not really men of cinema. These are not really cinéastes, uh, réalisateurs, if you like. Uh, they are littérateurs. And that this term takes on almost a kind of um, uh, contemptuous expression that one might refer to pornographers. Uh, and indeed, that some of the other um, I sort of uh, detail in Truffaut's uh, piece suggests that he almost regards them as this. Um, so um, there's a, uh, you know, there's a, the, we, can, we can really sense his frustration in this piece, and it is a manifesto. But at the same time, it's it's not one that's really necessarily founded on uh, on fact uh, and um, uh, detailed research. Um, and what I wanted to sort of go on to show here is that um, this is uh, uh, the debate around screenwriters and their role is not uh, a new thing. This is not something that suddenly emerged in the 1950s. It w really goes back to the coming of sound in French cinema, uh, where we have a, 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 a real debate again, uh, between uh, those who uh, really embraced sound for what it could do. Uh, and in particular people like Marcel Pagnol who you see on the right here 
who was very pleased because now he could show his plays to you know, uh, 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 as many people as would come to the cinema to see them. And indeed, he, he used the same cast uh, who had uh, uh, achieved great success in the theatre in filming many of his uh, films. And uh, people like René Clair here on the left, who uh, deplored the use of sound cinema. In fact, he would go on to become one of the most innovative uh, of directors working with sound in the early years. But initially, he saw this as uh, uh, th this kind of explosion of film theatre is really detrimental to the health uh, and the, the innovative possibilities of cinema um, because it, um, it prevented uh, cinema from uh, the using the kind of innovations and, and, and the possibilities of the medium as it had in the silent period and in some of his avant-garde films like Entracte for example um, but at the same time, you didn't have the liveness, uh, the live contact of, of real theatre. So for, hit, for, for Claire, this was an impoverishment of both uh, media. And uh, inevitably, this, it was the screenwriters who came, that the blame was laid at their door again. They were emerging as a new sort of role in the cinema world at this time. Uh, it, uh, and a role which lay, could lay claim to authorship, uh, quite importantly here. Uh, because uh, in the silent period, unlike in Hollywood, in French cinema, scripts were, were really very uh, cursory, perfunctory, and, and often you know, left in taxis, and uh, films would be improvised, and there's, there's many stories about this. Um, so it's only really in the le very late 1920s and, and 30s, once we have sound cinema, that the screenwriter emerges as a, as a key figure. Um, one thing um, we can also note is that the, the, there are moments when the, the screenwriters seem to be at the centre of debates and uh, these are moments when French cinema is also uh, it is a kind of, I don't know whether it's a coincidence I need to look into this more but they happen to be moments when French cinema is most contested in national terms so the coming of sound is a period where uh, on the one hand you have domestic audiences that are really hungry to hear their own language on the screen and flocking to cinemas but on the other hand the industry is losing out to uh, German and, and American uh, technology because it's, it's those companies that own the patents uh, for, for the sound technology um, and uh, g going back to, to, to Truffaut's uh, piece uh, in the post World War II period uh, French cinema after the liberation is left really in, in tatters and having to pick itself up from uh, um, what, uh, you know, ha after, after the um, occupation which wasn't a completely disastrous period by any means but, but the, the flood of American films into France uh, after the war um, means that uh, really the French cinema can't compete with this at all and that there is no money to, to invest um, so there are all sorts of uh, agreements that are signed and revised and in trying to protect the French film industry, agreements which are uh, eventually revised uh, uh, and it's really the, that, um, that that ensures the survival along with the imposition of a tax um, on box office receipts uh, in 1948 and from then on the, there is a, 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 an increase in production. Um, and uh, right, I'll, I'll leave that there. <laughs> Move on. Um, this sort of leads into questions around national cinema more generally. In film studies, the concept of national cinema is is a bit um, out of fashion, really. Um, every it, it, in, it's been left to one side in favour of the transnational. Uh, um, and uh, perhaps uh, you know, uh, Tim Bergfelder's work uh, he has looked at uh, uh, what he has termed the supranational uh, Ham, uh, Hamid Nafisi has talked about accented cinemas so looking at cinemas that are produced perhaps within a national context but really do not fit what, what one would uh, normally uh, term, uh, think of as, as the, the, the national production um, on the other hand um, the, um, 
ideas about national cinema are very much alive in other areas beyond the academic sphere. So in relation to policy, marketing, uh, audience expectation, um, and you can see just from these uh, posters here for recent uh, French film festivals, uh, this is the, um, a soundtrack to go with this, uh, the Alliance Française French Film Festival from Canberra for this year. Uh, so Frenchy, so chic, I don't know if you can read this. And this is, you know, this recurs all the time. Um, I saw an article in the Telegraph, uh, which I don't often read, but it did happen <laughs> <laughs> uh, on Sunday, uh, reviewing the f uh, a new book on French cinema, and it took, uh, the opening sentence was, what is it that gives, uh, uh, what, what is the je ne sais quoi that gives French cinema its Gallic charm, or something <laughs> like that. So there's all kinds of assumptions. Here. Um, if we, um, so if we sort of embrace the ideas of the transnational and look uh, at, at the expense of the national, we risk overlooking the, the role that these discourses are playing in these other spheres. And also, um, we, we also um, there is also a danger that in moving beyond that, that we uh, ignore certain specificities in relation to geography and history that um, might be uh, emerging in French cinema. And one of these, I I in cinema generally, sorry, and one of these is, is relates to language. Um, <coughs> How am I doing? Okay. Um, so can we speak about a, a specifically French cinema then? Well, Jeanette, uh, there are many scholars who've, who've worked on this, but Jeanette Vincent recently has kind of talked uh, uh, about, uh, really drawn out three key areas that she argues are where French cinema differentiates itself from Hollywood. Uh, and for, for my purposes today, I'm most interested in this one, this question of sound. Other work has been done on music. Uh, Phil Powery, for example, uh, Charles O'Brien from Canada, uh, Michel Chion working in France. Um, but there is very little work on dialogue. There is, to my knowledge, one book by Michel Chion that was published very recently, but it doesn't really mention the people who wrote that dialogue. It talks about performance and so on. Um, now, this brings me to the, uh, to, to gives me a chance to explain my title, Transmitting the Atmosphere. Um, I don't know if any of you uh, uh, picked up on this reference, but um, uh, it, it's, it comes from one of the most famous lines uh, from French cinema, uh, which is pronounced by Arletti, who you see here on the right, uh, to Louis Jouvet, and uh, hopefully I can play it for you now. I'm afraid... It's not subtitled, but... Right. <coughs> it's not subtitled, but you can um, hear uh, her delivery at least and, um, and get a sense of the film. This comes from Hôtel du Nord, a film from 1938 uh, directed by Marcel Carney and the dialogue is written by Henri Janson who uh, mentioned before. Au Colony. Avec quoi C'est idée. Alors ça sera pas tout pareil. J'ai besoin de changer l'atmosphère et mon atmosphère c'est toi. C'est la première fois qu'on traite d'atmosphère. Si je suis une atmosphère, il y a un drôle de blade. Oh là là, des types qui sont du milieu sans en être et qui craignent à cause de ce qu'ils ont été, on devrait les vider. Atmosphère, atmosphère, est-ce que j'ai une gueule d'atmosphère Puisque c'est ça, vas-y tout seul à la barène. Bonne pêche et bonne atmosphère. Okay. Oops. Okay, bonne pêche et bonne atmosphère. Um, so here we see uh, uh, this um, uh, argument between. Uh, Arletti's character and, and her lover, who is bad news. I mean, she's better off without him, believe me. Um, but uh, what's, what's really... This line has gone down in French history, first of all because of how... Uh, uh, in cinema history, because of how Arletti delivers it uh, with this tremendous panache and also with her particular Parisian accent. Um, uh, uh, but also because of it's seen as, as having a double sense here, of really 
being a line that not doesn't just refer to the uh, the scene that's going on between the lovers, but really to poetic realist cinema, uh, which is seen as having its own atmosphere, <coughs> and was often described in those terms even at this in this period. And also, the, the, you know, really a, a way of animating the set. This is a reconstruction uh, here of the Canal Saint Martin, and the, the Hotel du Nord is on the banks of this canal, this working class district. Uh, and this film has, uh, you know, played a part in the regeneration of this area in Paris uh, uh, today. Um, now, uh, to go back to Vincent Dour, she talks about uh, language in uh, relation to the cinema of this period, and she says. Um, its vernacular variations, its poetry, its accents are a key to the cinema of the 1930s. We could say that this is also true of other decades, though. Um, this was reflected, uh, Vincent goes on, in the special status of the new brand of scriptwriters, adapters and dialogue writers who emerged at the coming of sound. And it is these people who uh, we want to investigate. What was their role? What was their impact in writing uh, this dialogue? It is not realistic, it is often very poetic, uh, as we see here, the, the, the use of repetition, uh, variation and so on, and, and the, the, the ways that writers wrote for particular performers who would then bring these words to life uh, is, is something uh, also to consider. <coughs> right. I'm almost finished. <laughs> so, language uh, and uh, th there is a question then as to why, if this, is, this seems so obvious, why is there so little work in this area? Well, I, I can't say for sure, and I think that there are probably many reasons, but I'd like to just point out three possible ones. The first really is that um, the, the theories of national cinema first developed in relation to British cinema through the work of uh, notably Andrew Higson in the late 1980s. Um, now, national cinemas... Uh, uh, theory really evolved in, uh, as a way of uh, differentiating the production in particular national context from Hollywood seen as the global cinema um, for British cinema then language was not the key uh, issue of differentiation and although obviously there would be work to be done on language difference uh, it wasn't something that really came out uh, in those early, that early work the second uh, point to make, I think, is uh, the legacy of the new wave, which has really led to a French, uh, and I, I think it's not an exaggeration to call it an obsession, with mise-en-scène, with the image as being the, you know, the, the most important aspect of film. The really, um, so the privileging of the director as auteur, it really eclipses the, the in input of other contributors, and especially screenwriters who have been so dismissed uh, by uh, Truffaut and, and, and other critics uh, associated with the new wave. And then the third sort of key point would be um, the way in which the word, unlike the moving image, which is seen as really you know, um, unique to cinema and being the, the, uh, uh, something really specific to that art form, the word is seen to be borrowed from literature, from theatre, and this is seen to trouble the purity of the septième art that the, uh, uh, the, the, the new wave critics were trying to, to establish and, 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 and really uh, affirm. Um, so I'd just like to finish up then by uh, really sort of outlining some of the research questions that we're hoping to address as a way of beginning to sort of delve into some of these issues and look further into this area. So firstly, and we'll, we'll be looking at specific writers uh, in ca as case studies here, from the coming of sound to the present day, um, luckily Isabel knows about contemporary stuff because as you can see I'm much more uh, at the other end. Um, what is the role of screenwriters in the filmmaking process? This is, you know, that different people had different specialisms, they ad adapted existing texts, they wrote original screenplays, some just wrote dialogue, Prévert, uh, Janson, they, they, they simply, they looked at a, a, a script and they added the words that the actors then spoke and they worked very often with particular actors as well. Um, 
Secondly, what practices emerge at different periods? So I've already mentioned this film theatre. What sort of impact did that have? Um, and what other things were going on at this time? What's the role of language and of dialogue in, in relation to these particular things that emerge? What about new wave cinema? What is the role of the script and the screenplay in that? The myth is that the, this is a, a, a cinema of um, improvisation, but we know that that's, that's not the case. <coughs> what narrative patterns and structures emerge? One of the things Michel Chion has argued is that fatalism is you know, really something that is central in French cinema, and not just to you know, poetic realism. Um, that's a hypothesis that we would really quite like to test <laughs> further. How has the professional position of screenwriters evolved within the French film industry? That's the, the legal position as well as um, you know, their, their actual role um, within a, a, a particular studios and so on. And what does critical discourse have to do with that? Um, and how, what's the impact, what's the relationship between those critical discourses and how this has been written about in academic circles? Um, okay, I'll finish there. Thank you. Thanks to all our speakers and for keeping so out of time. Would you like to come and stand up and sprint? Um, we'll open up to questions from, uh, from the floor. Anne is straight in there. Oh, I know. Yes. Yes. Um, oh, now, and it is first to all three people, um, including Sarah, because although you say you are an interloper, what strikes me with all three papers is that you're actually talking about, as it were, transmitters getting to our uh, conference, the, the role of human intervention in this whole question of transmitting something or other. Well, um, I'm not a philosophical person, but it seems to me that there is something really um, fundamental in the fact that none of this transmission occurs without human agency, and all three of you have pointed out in some way that the fact that there is human agency involved is having an effect mm -hmm. on what is um, trans transmitted. And I think this is something key to a lot of what all of us are, are talking about. And the whole question of modern languages, you know, the fact that you know, language is spoken by people, these people transmitting and transmitters. And so I think, uh, I haven't really got much further than that, but I think that is that thread that the three of you have got in common is that whole role of human agency. Mm -hmm. and that is yeah, and of course that opens just enormous philosophical questions because we're not professionals or anything like this. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to think of that answer from that. Mm -hmm. just following on from that really it's not an answer it's just a continuation um, yes and I think that you know that there, there is there are two sides to the, the uh, any transmission uh, and that is also the case for those um, you know producing a discourse and those at the receiving uh, end and, and how that gets received and, and interpreted and so on and, and that I mean it's particularly struck me about your two papers and uh, you know how these te who is reading those mm -hmm. texts and what they're reading them for mm -hmm. is obviously of yeah. uh, crucial importance. Yeah. And um, also there's human agency, yes, that impacts on what is transmitted, but also there's also, um, of course, language and language is. So, um, and that is mm. another, um, the issue of translation, of actually um, how language competence shapes what is transmitted, what is selected is really quite um, uh, significant. For instance, if you're talking about early post-war Holocaust testimonies, the vast majority of that was in Polish, followed by Yiddish. Now, Holocaust studies is a field that is largely anglophone, hence uh, scholars are so fond of uh, video testimony that has just started being generated in the 1980s and 1990s, because it's all conveniently in English. Um, Boda was, even by um, high standards of um, uh, pre-war uh, East European Jewry, immensely polyglot. Um, he conducted those languages in nine different languages. Yeah, it would put most of us to their paces, I think, uh, uh, quite, quite nicely. But um, he was not a native speaker in most of these, obviously. And if you actually look at the way he translated some of the um, interviews that he conducted, you see 
the glitches, the difficulties, although he tried to make a virtue out of vice by sort of saying, oh, I'm keeping the imperfections to render uh, the difficulty of languages that the interlocutors, uh, the, the, uh, the interviewees also had uh, to give a bit of the rawness of, um, uh, of, of that. But quite often he introduced mistakes that weren't there in the original, which is, which is quite quite interesting as a poli uh, policy, yeah, so, so agency in terms of human interaction, in terms of questions, answers, selection, who are we writing for, who are transmitting for, but also in what linguistic shape and medium. Mm -hmm. I see, there's the, 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 an added element, a layer of human interaction as your interaction, I was interested how you were interpreting even the pauses on the tape, and yes. I mean that, that again adds another, as you say, mm -hmm. philosophical dimension. Uh, um, how do you deal with the, the ethics of that sort of role of you, you coming in, interpreting minute pauses and, and, and uh, nuances mm -hmm. in the voices, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. not being reflecting on, on, on your own role as researcher? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. um, um, it, it, it's quite difficult and it's, um, I, I guess it's, it's a little easier with um, actually with texts that are explicit, ironically speaking. Mm -hmm. Texts that are not explicit and marginalize what had, has happened more, I find more difficult mm -hmm. to deal with. Mm -hmm. So for instance, there's one set of, of, of texts that have got complete, um, which would not normally qualify as testimonies proper. They're just basically bureaucratic forms um, that basically give you the key data of, of survivors. Um, and this, these were um, collated by um, Americans, um, by American officials um, interviewing um, uh, basically uh, children in DP camps. And um, so you, you get on the first page just name, address, name of father, name of mother, date of birth, last address before deportation, and then you get all these horrible um, um, data of, of, you know, just uh, 1943 deportation to Auschwitz, wh whatever. Um, and then you get, um, at the bottom of, the, of these forms, you get all the family members who have been lost. And just, I don't know, um, uh, sister, 17 years, last heard of in Stutthof, and things like that. And then over leave, you get the impression of, uh, and the comment of the, of the American interviewer on the personality of the testifying child. It just says, say, child is clean and good looking. You think like that, you think, no. Things you find un so unethical today, you mm -hmm. couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And I interestingly enough, if you screen the whole um, uh, lot of those texts, uh, those sorts of comments you tend to find um, disproportionately frequently uh, when there is talk of a child who, wants to, who has said that they want to go to the USA. The ones that wanted to stay behind, or, or so they, they were not so important, not so interesting. But the scrutiny happens mm -hmm. when a child says, oh, I've got an aunt in New York, and I want to go and live with her. And then it's, yeah, um, child hasn't got very many aspirations, or seems to be quite clever, or whatever. Heartless um, comments from our point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that I find more difficult than the text that I have given you a little bit of a glimpse of um, today. I think there were more questions, Richard, do you want to come yeah, in? Yeah, uh, a question to Beate. Um, it seemed to me that you have uh, made this the assumption that uh, um, this matter of fact tone uh, in which children talk about loss of parents and uh, siblings uh, was somehow unnatural and uh, they would talk about it more emotionally if uh, the setting was different. Uh, I was wondering whether you have any evidence from, say, uh, children growing up in uh, peacetime uh, similarly going through uh, loss of family, wh uh, whether they actually talk in, 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 um, mm. in any other way than this matter of fact way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, <coughs> to be honest, I think that, that is the most um, natural way of talking about it. Mm. 
Not sure. I showed the one slide of, 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 of the girl who yeah. talks about um, um, how um, she um, was, was hiding under this pile of brushes and then how she, when she was reunited, reunited with her mother, um, how she discovered that the father and aunts were missing and how she and the mother um, both uh, uh, cried. And I've got several um, uh, texts that are much more um, openly emotional about loss of parents um, by um, uh, children who were actually not in the interview situation with the CJHC uh, staff, but rather whose te uh, testimonies have been sent into that organization. You can see that in the comments they were quite bureaucratic and quite good about marking um, you know, in the forms how they had come by a particular um, a text. So um, there seems there's, there's more of a tendency towards more emotionality and more open addressing of the, the own emotional response. You can also see it with regard to other um, uh, uh, holdings. Um, I'm actually working on a book with uh, somebody uh, that is going to be an edition of, of unpublished um, Yiddish child Holocaust uh, testimonies where you get uh, this, um, f compared to other holdings, a disproportionately high um, number of texts that express, say, desire for revenge or feelings of shame and guilt, uh, where there is more of um, an emotional presence. But yes, um, uh, the problem you always have with talking when you're talking about assumed absence is that you assume something uh, that you have an idea, conception of what ideally speaking or normally should be there. And that's a kind of problem is very difficult to, to, to negotiate. That, that is true. But that's why I'm looking at the context um, uh, to illuminate what factors might have impacted on the actual text. And the texts that were sober that I presented to you were written up by the adult interlocutors, assuming the role of the child. You had a question? Yes, but Sarah, you mentioned Misha Shion, he mentions uh, Siano. I don't think that's you know, the, one of the characteristics of French cinema is who do you know, and that actually has an internal impact on spoken French because. What matters more was written, or you know, it's not written, it's cinema, but mm. therefore, I mean, I think Sion said that there is no accent in French cinema, or if there is an accent, it's foreign. Well, so yeah. The actress, because what we want really is to tell on cinema, what's said, and you know, and not. But she also talks about the impossibility of being neutral, of, of attaining a neutral language in French cinema that he thinks exists in other languages, although I think his English isn't quite good enough <laughs> when he's talking about some of these things. Um, so, you know, he's saying that in cinematic language is, is, is always inflected and that French doesn't have a, a kind of neutral register. Um, uh, and uh, and that, that's a very interesting uh, idea to explore. Certainly you can see, I mean, Aletti's register is anything but neutral here. <laughs> it's a bit of an extreme example, but... More recent, you know, although very recently, regional languages <coughs> come back with Yang Shi's team, but that's a person's exaggeration anyway. Of course. But also in films, I was talking to Richard earlier about uh, Entre les Murs, for example, where I think language is a re really the subject of that film. Um, and indeed, the, the, there is a whole debate about the imperfect subjunctive I in <laughs> that <laughs> film. <laughs> L'esquive, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Are you going to be looking at intertitles? I just thought you jump from sound to from free sound to sound and what happens when the word becomes, when you see the words on the screen or is that... Oh, we're not looking at silent right? film, we're looking at yeah, yeah. from the coming of sound on and not... Yeah, it's, it's already too much. Sorry, <laughs> Henry. Um, it, it occurred to me when listening to you uh, that really as soon as transmission comes in, um, you get a third dimension added to the text, of course. And um, that was a thing we... we um, ended up with an, in our panel or the panel um, A what consequences does it have for editing mm -hmm. um, these texts because uh, if you want to, to make visible these changes over time over media 
um, over languages, how do you incorporate the addition? But I'm wondering whether that would be a question to ask to the whole forum, because we are supposed to be over with the others at uh, 5 p.m. So I'm, I'm just posing the question. <laughs> wouldn't mm -hmm. expect you to answer it here, but I think it, it might be something we might want all to uh, discuss mm -hmm. together. Can we thank our speakers again for three weeks? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the chair. Uh, no, no, it wasn't irrelevant. I mean, it's not actually irrelevant because um, it's really interesting. I think they just bummed up anyway. In France, whereas in Hollywood, they really worked on it. And the language was, you know, they really, really, they employed teams of writers to do these intertitles.